And that gets us to oh, the, the oh. fictional text, yeah. uh, which is, in a way, uh, the, the, the ho most horrible question. What's the book about? Okay. Uh, no, no, the, I, yeah. if, no, if I you can't. don't mind. Uh, in a way, one could say this is a book about a man and a woman meeting up and getting closer to each other. Mm. It's basically boy meets girl, mm. uh, to bring it to the cliched uh, uh, mm. image. But obviously, it's a lot more than that. But you decided to write about a subject that is um, big and emotional, mm. love, without irony. Yeah, sort of straight up book about love, really. Um, I mean, the answer to where it came from will clear the room because it came from a dream. Um, <laughs> and it was actually not the dream itself, which was a very strange, it was a nightmare um, about watching someone approach a street corner in the rain and there was a puddle and they stepped into, and I was sort of watching from over here. I was in and not in the scene. I was them and I was me. And they stepped into the puddle and disappeared. And then someone else came along. And I was thinking, can I warn them? And they went in as well. And then a hand came up out of the puddle. And was I supposed to take the hand? And I woke up and forgot the dream immediately. And then several months later, was walking in snow. And I stepped into the snow and it gave way. And I screamed. And as I screamed, the whole dream came back to me. And I became very interested in how my memory had fixed this repeated gesture of a foot giving way, of, the, of what's beneath you giving way. And it became the starting point for this, this book, which is, which is about the problems of two people in their middle age coming towards each other, but every gesture they make towards each other is freighted by the times those gestures have been made before and the associations and memories activated by that gesture. So I had this sort of image in my head of these, this man and woman very slowly, and as they reach out, it's almost like a kind of drag. Um, everything they remember, everything they've experienced is, is weighing on that, on that moment. Um, so they... In, and yet. <laughs> that, of course, is the, the, the... And yet is the marvelous thing that we long to hear about. Mm -hmm. And it's very much um, a book about that getting closer, but it's also about London as a cityscape. Yeah, it is. So uh, London is the third person, so yeah. to speak, simply because that is where you live or where this seems to be happening. Yeah, I, I, you know, I've lived in London almost all my life, bar seven years, and 30 years in the, exactly the same square mile. And, uh, and it's a wonderful and terrible place, and it's very formative. Um, to my writing, so I wanted to address it as well. There is a wonderful way that these characters start, and you have a sentence about people saying yes. Oh, I'm going to read that bit. Yeah. Exactly, and that yes. is, yeah. um, would be marvellous to yes. hear. Okay. Um, forgive my nerves, because I've never re read any of this to anybody. Um, and about three people have seen it, but there we go. There's lots of water. This is a section, two, two small sections from it. The book is called In the City of Love's Sleep. Imagine a woman running. The long corridors are dark except for the red blips of the smoke detectors and the green vapor of low-level security lighting. She slams her raised hands into each set of fire doors and pushes hard so that they flap behind her as if urging someone to follow her. Is someone following her? She takes the stairs two and then three at a time. These are the back stairs, their shallow concrete worn to slipperiness. And as she reaches the top, she stumbles, bruises her knee, gets up and keeps running. There's her office door, but the key, where is the key? She pushes a hand into her bag, but her fingers can't make sense of anything. They're not fingers at all. And so she shakes the bag, hears a clink, pushes her hand through again and still can't find them. Is someone coming? She tips the bag onto the floor, grabs the keys, rushes in, and stands against the wall trying to catch her breath. She watches the open door. Nothing happens. There was no touch, only the thought of it, not even a thought, less than thought. Her body was responding to what? What did he look like? 
His face had already slipped out of her grasp. When they spoke, she could not meet his gaze. If she saw him the following day, she might well walk straight past him. Something, what, about him woke a part of her that she had almost forgotten, but which is right now the part of herself most defining and defined. Where is he? She's watching the open door, although she knows he will not come. She doesn't want him to come. Who is he, anyway? A man who turned towards her while unbuttoning his coat. The moment of recognition was so strong that she had to stop herself from reaching out to take it. They left the cloakroom together, walked into the hall side by side, and then moved apart. She spoke to colleagues and acquaintances, and she waited. If you'd asked her what she was waiting for, she wouldn't have been able to say. For the next hour, she didn't think about him at all, but she moved and spoke as if knowing herself watched. At certain points, she caught sight of him, and there was recognition in the smallest detail, how he held a glass or nodded his head. She knew him, only of course she didn't. All that had happened was that she had been reminded of something by the way he unbuttoned his coat. Neither could later remember how their conversation began. It was a turning towards one another as natural as waking. Within minutes, they were talking about their fathers, both architects who were not successful and both now dead. And she asked him, had he wanted to become one too? Was it expected of him as it had been of her? And he laughed and said, no, his father never thought him clever enough. And anyway, what interested him was cupboards and what they contained. All the while he was talking, she was trying to make sense of his name, his face, his voice, none of which were straightforward. She was telling him about her work, how she too was interested in small things. She was about to ask if he would like to, what, come up to her office there and then, even though the reception was ending and there was someone who she could tell was waiting for him, standing at the boundary of her awareness. She took his card, said goodbye, and acknowledging no one, walked out. Through the row of banners and the press boards, back through the darkened hall, past the locomotives and rockets, and on up to the small things, the jealousy glass, the bone skates, the cloud mirror, the merman, any of which could have been what she offered, what brought him into the dark with her. In that moment, she saw it all, that her body was ticking, and had she asked and had he followed, she would have done anything. So sharply did the space between them fall away. She was right on the edge of it, and so she slipped out onto the back stairs and she ran. Yes. One night long ago, before I knew anything much about anything, I met a man at a dinner. It was a large and formal occasion to which I'd been invited at the last minute by my employer as someone else had dropped out. I knew no one and realized as soon as I got there that I was wrongly dressed. All this meant I was particularly grateful when the man sitting beside me introduced himself warmly and confided that he didn't know anyone else there either, except, and at this he gestured towards a sharply tailored woman with a cloud of silver blonde hair, his wife. I looked towards her and at that moment, she shook hands with the man about to sit down beside her. I saw it in her face. Yes. She was saying yes to this stranger, as you can only say yes to someone who's saying yes to you. Yes, they said to each other. Yes. This is not the yes of accepting something offered. Nothing's been offered, but that of recognition. What is it we recognize? We can say yes to a stranger without even slowing down as we pass. The stranger is rich in tension, both a body and a blank surface, recognized and unknown. Every day, people say yes to each other. And what we learn is that most of the time, it doesn't apply or relate or sustain. In adolescence, love is like a river urgently in need of direction. It might flow towards a horse, a hero, a mermaid, a singer. These are love's rehearsals. One day, the river flows towards someone who is real and there. This suggests that the feeling comes to us before the subject, and yet that's not how it's experienced. A 15-year-old girl is struck by the boy who cycles past her window each evening. She is not struck by her love. Only when it's over and she has discovered his ordinary nature might she wonder. Probably not. She will go on experiencing the yes in herself 
and only years later, when it, has, when it has led not only to the gentle disappointment of the boy on the bicycle, but to damage and pain, might she stop within it and say, not yes, but I know what this is. I'm saying yes, that's all. It's just memory, association, need, desire, nothing. Or she will look at the man she's chosen and remember the first time she saw him and how her whole self said yes, and here they are in a life together. In hindsight, we call it love at first sight, when yes is met with yes, and circumstances or propensities allow it to amplify unending. I have wondered from time to time what happened to the couple at that dinner. The man persisted in talking to me, trying for minutes at a time not to look at his wife, only sooner or later his head would turn and his sentence trail off. Not once when I followed his gaze did I see his wife look back. Did she carry home this encounter like a jewel slipped into her pocket, something she might find in her hands now and then, turn over and let drop? Or was whatever remained of her love for her husband demolished by that evening's strength and shine? If their marriage had come to an end, would probably say it was always going to do so and that the stranger's attention had only formulated her discontent in a way that made it impossible to carry on. Whether she never saw him again or left her husband and lives happily with the stranger to this day, the yes they were saying to one another was so strong that I can still see them. At the other end of that crowded, noisy table, they were terribly clear. She had turned her seat towards him and remained fixed there. I remember her long neck and floating hair, her arm propped on the table, her hand holding a glass as if it were a divine attribute. He leaned back as if to receive her and spread his arms, one disappearing along the back of her chair. At a certain point he left the table and I saw to my surprise that he looked exactly like her husband, who at that moment had spilled his drink and so did not notice the stranger pass. It doesn't have to be a stranger. It can be someone you've known for years, who was once the person who walked into the room, who sat next to you at dinner, cycled past your window, or unbuttoned his coat. There must have been a moment of yes, but of the kind that is folded away. I wish I could remember how you and I first met, and when we said yes, but I can't. All I know is that in 20 years I have never been indifferent to your presence. That has been all I've allowed myself until now. Now we are unattached, but we are not empty-handed. I would not go so far as to say that we are free. Mm. <laughs> well, this is truly magical and very exciting, I think, to all of us. And uh, it's very generous of you to let us hear something that obviously is being heard for the first time. And uh, I think saying yes is going to be the word for the evening and probably for the seminar. So we're definitely going to say yes to many, many exciting texts. And um, I almost feel like, like a bit of a sort of taskmaster to, <laughs> to propel you on. And I suggest that we move on to your new poems. Yeah. Uh, and again, another premiere. So this is, you're really being treated uh, uh, with fantastic experiences here because, uh, Lavinia, you have also been writing poetry uh, in about a subject that you never expected no. this poetry to be about. I was given a, a nice commission to spend a year um, with three artists from other forms thinking about the question of staying where you are. For me, it immediately became a question of staying in the present tense and my difficulty with that. And I tried to write 
um, very much in the, in the moment. Um, and, and this title came up, The Built Moment, because I, I seem to be writing about the way in which we try to fix or process each moment. Um, and what I didn't know I was writing about was my father, who has um, Alzheimer's. And a year ago, I could have a conversation with him, and now he doesn't know who I am. So that's really what it's become about. He is intensely present moment, and he's not there at all. Shall I... Um, And again, I haven't read this, so forgive me if I stumble. From the built moment, beside myself. When I receive the message that a friend has died, I'm out in the city among windows and strangers. I examine each face I pass, but find no one who shares this news. The windows capture a series a woman in shock. See how little of her can now occur. I walk on, his death beside me. It's not something I can absorb or reject. It is beside me. I walk on, in actuality and in reflection. In reflection is my trace and essence. I walk on. I'm making a list of my father. Opening every drawer, taking off each lid, reading each note, reaching into every pocket, and yet he is not dead. But we, his children, have never known what he means. Roman coins, elastic bands, a pencil with a tassel. A panorama for and of my father. Paths of chalk and water, the perpendicular highways of night creatures, ridged contours and jackknife shadows, cropped growth on compacted slopes, the press from above and below, unreachable fields where light is deflected, pearled and pooled so that it just hangs there. Desynchronosis, which is jet lag. A dislocation of context and response the brother I haven't seen in years comes back from the other side of the world to meet me in a place we've never been. It is too small for him. Someone I knew in another life appears at a gathering. Every time I turn towards him, another of myself steps out. She once lay down in the snow. She carried her lover through a cave beneath a river. He killed her. We stand there, side by side. Straight in. Is this how it was when they reached in and worked your heart, this thunderbolt directly over the house that lifts me out of sleep as if out of the earth and sends my blood running in reverse? Did they take in your, their hands your built and half-ruined self and study it as they would a cave in which they'd glimpsed the most unexpected formations? Did they restore the tide so all that made its way in still met with your acoustic, your transformation of breaking water into gentle metal? My father's loss of feeling. I've been talking about feeling and how we want to feel, but what we hope for from feeling is total and opaque, which is what we hope for from not feeling too. And how feeling and not feeling are one desire for enlargement out of the self and the loss of detail and qualification this brings. So my father, who has lost detail and qualification, should feel without discrimination. He should feel everything as if it were nothing, and he does. My father tells me to wait. When I arrive, he's eating, and I'm told to wait, to let him finish, not to unsettle him. I wait. When he finally sees me, it's as if he's been brought to an open door and made to peer into a dark night. He's afraid to ask who's there. What if someone's there? He'd have to invite them in and accompany them through time. He peers at me, and the space between us extends itself so that I am where he wants me, out there in the dark, in a place without stars or fathers, and he raises his hand and says, 
Stay there. Stay there. Thank you for finding words for something that I think many in this audience will know more about than they ever wished to know about. And mm. I think it's the dementia, Alzheimer, all of those phases has become um, a topic that many people are affected by. And it very much is not a topic that lends itself to words in so many ways. Uh, and those who are, who have experienced this with relatives know this to their painful cost. And I think it's very brave to try and find words about it, but mm. then isn't that exactly what a I'd, poet should do? Yeah, and I wasn't trying, I didn't know what I was doing. I was writing about what was happening. Um, and he was what was happening. And, uh, and I was, because you, you, you will, all the writers here will know this, that you, 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 you translate and formulate experience. It's what we do. It's how we make sense of ourselves and the world. And so obviously at the back of my head, I must have been um, doing that. And, and I thought I'd be writing about what happened in the day. And, and I was writing about him. Yeah. And again, um, all of these new texts have been uh, in different ways and uh, forms about finding a form of expression. So mm. form intention, I think, is exactly what all of your work yeah. is about. And I was thinking about um, the vast extent as mm -hmm. one title and then the built moment. <laughs> I hadn't thought about that. One is a sort of unending spatial uh, image, and the other is temporal and very closed in. So is this the tension that you're writing between? Yeah, I think so. I think so. Um, yeah, I think that uh, that it's all between... Yeah, that, 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 that trying... Insisting on... Or depending upon upon tension of all kinds in order to activate things and also the things that catch you um, and being operating on a very veering scale which I think again writers tend to do I mean I I'm, I'm either looking at the stone on the ground or I'm looking at the whole of the sky I'm not really looking at the tree I'm about to bump into <laughs> um, it's very very much like that yes yes one last question before we open up for uh, discussion or for questions from the audience. From me is, um, when do the titles of books come in for you? So did The Built Moment have a title early on? No. Or The Casual Perfect? No. Um, I Things start collecting, particularly with poems. I, I'm not somebody who thinks of a group of poems. You just put them in a drawer and then they start talking to each other and then you, you start listening. Um, but then suddenly you hit a phrase and I don't know where either of, I mean, I know where the casual perfect came from because it's a quote, but um, the built moment just came up in a line when I was working on that and I just knew that it was, it captured what I was trying to do or it was the pivot. I think really of titles as pivots Mm -hmm. around which everything can move.